Hello, thank you for your interest in my presentation, The Now and Future Festival, Literary Performance and the Disembodied Book. I am Janelle Zuha, reference librarian and professor at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. This paper explores current trends in the worldwide phenomenon known as the Literary Festival. It focuses on several large, long-established English festivals, such as those at Bath, Hay, and Oxford, as well as the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. It hypothesizes on the lure of the Literary Festival, on the nature of the reader experience, and speculates about the effects of the e-book and e-reader. Before we look at the festivals as they are today, I'd like to step back in time a bit with a quote from the Edinburgh Chambers Journal of 1837. Some time ago, a public literary festival took place in New York, which was attended by authors, printers, publishers, booksellers, and other individuals connected with the important and thriving business of literary production and dissemination. At the dinner, numerous animating speeches were delivered, and the whole affair went off with great eclat. The literary festival is not a new phenomenon, although we don't have particulars about this New York festival that took place sometime before December 16, 1837. We can imagine its resemblance to festivals in the succeeding 175 years. Disparate participants rubbing elbows and re debating ideas and opinions. Food and beverages are served and conversation runs high, perhaps around formal dinner tables. Authors are introduced, met, listened to, queried, and applauded. Commerce and consumption of food, books, and ideas is the primary context. Readers are not specifically mentioned as part of the gathering, but since this was a, quote, public literary festival, readers must surely have been included and were most likely male, well-educated, middle-aged, and middle-to-upper-class. We can easily overlay on this historic picture some of our own experiences in the world of the literary festival today, such as white marquee tents, which appear not to be that modern after all. Crowds that are now mixed gender, but predominantly female. Crowds that contain all ages, including children, but are still predominantly middle-aged and middle to upper class, and primarily white, in the UK and US, that is. Crowds that have a great interest in the commerce and consumption of books and ideas. What we can't really imagine is the extent of the 19th century festival goer's shock at some of the more noticeable changes evident in today's literary festival, with its focus on the commerce of entertainment, not just ideas and books, its aura of glitter and celebrity, its an intersection of multiple media, its existence in several worlds at once, the physical and the digital, the synchronous and the asynchronous. The sheer number of festivals currently staged in the UK and Ireland alone, tallied at was 150 or more by the website Festival Central, is somewhat shocking even to the 21st century mind. The literary festival has clearly evolved into an industry. The popularity of literary festivals is evident not only in their proliferation across the countryside and the web, but in the numbers of authors and audience members who flock to them. Looking at some basic statistics for two high-profile events, the Hay Festival in the UK and the Library of Congress's National Book Festival in the US, reveals that festivals appear to be in a major growth mode today. They are also popular with the mainstream media, securing important sponsors such as national newspapers, television networks, and major corporations, as well as local and national libraries. What's going on here? Literary festivals are obviously well-loved if these numbers are anything to go by, but they are often also disparaged for their commercial or entertainment emphasis, criticized for dumbing down public literary discourse, and for elevating authors to rock star status. Rarely are they examined as serious cultural events. But beneath their surface sensual and commercial nature, beneath even the latest digitally enhanced experience they offer, literary festivals today are complex sites of contention for meaning and reader experience, not just recreational gatherings of vacuous author worshippers, greedy publishers, and jaded writers. It's time we took more notice of these festivals, especially while we try to sort out what's on the horizon for the book world, as more and more digital content and communication is demanded by readers at the festivals. By looking more closely at aspects of them, we can see how they reflect the complexities of the current relationship between authors and readers, the print book and the digital text. We may even be able to see into the future of some of these relationships. For example, let's focus briefly on one event at the Sunday Times Oxford Literary Festival in 2011. The author featured at this event was Kazuo Ishiguro, a Japanese 
immigrant to England whose very British novels have been celebrated around the world. Ishiguro's appearance at the Oxford Festival took the form of a conversation rather than a reading and was set in Christopher Wren's 17th century masterpiece, The Sheldonian Theater. The audience was seated in tiers around and above the author in his comfortably upholstered chair on a small dais where he was joined by the chief fiction reviewer from the Sunday Times. The Sheldonian appeared filled almost to capacity. No doubt some audience members were tweeting the event or checking in on Facebook, posting photos and comments while the author spoke. At first glance, this event could be dismissed as yet another author adulation session, adoring fans hanging on every word, committing intentional fallacy crimes en masse in their hopes of better understanding the writer's most recent work by hearing what he has to say about its meaning. Of course, those present had presumably engaged prior to the event in the very private internal act of reading the author's words, whether in a paper-based book or on an e-reading device. And certainly one thing to be gained at an event like this is an expanded perspective on the worth of the author's work. But attributing audience motivation entirely to a desire for better understanding of what they have read is off mark because of the number of more, much more convenient paths to this understanding. Interviews or conversations with him abound in print and on the web. Likewise, reducing audience motivation to celebrity worship is equally weak. They are not near him in this theater, can barely see him, and have little hope in such a large gathering of getting any nearer, even if a book signing is held afterwards. Indeed, one might feel better connected to the author simply by sharing something on his Facebook page. I would suggest that some of this superficial motivation is present, but that what is actually happening is more complex than even the audience is aware. Let's look more broadly at the general festival experience in which this type of event is embedded. All of these festivals share physical, sensual characteristics that appeal to readers. Festivals are located in places that have specific cultural and geographic meaning. This is as true for smaller events such as the St. Ives Literature Festival as it is for larger festivals located in cultural centers such as Bath, Oxford, and Washington, D.C., and that take on larger topics and higher profile authors. Even more specifically, festival events are often staged in buildings and rooms that embody aspects of culture such as history and literature. It would be difficult, for instance, for the audience's experience of Ishiguro's appearance to be unaffected by its physical location. Equally evocative are locations such as the Bodleian Library, the Dining Hall at Christ Church College of Hogwarts Hall fame, the Debating Chamber of the Cambridge Union, the Library at Christ Church College, or the Bath Guild Hall. Even in the case of marquee-dominated events such as the Hay Festival and the National Book Festival, the location of the festival carefully connects participants with culture. The town of Hay is world-renowned for its number of bookshops. The National Book Festival takes place in the National Mall, a park that is crowded with museums and monuments. Add to this lure of location the attraction and press of other readers, the heft and spectacle of piles of signed and unsigned books and the potential they represent, because every festival still sells physical books at this stage. One look at the bulging programs of today's festivals attests to their sensual appeal. Interleaving the standard author panels, readings, and conversations are programs on music, comedy, gin tasting, and other, and other refined pastimes, as well as theatrical performances of literary texts. Top this off with authors of offers of elaborate dinners and exotic foods often prepared by celebrity cooks, and it is no wonder that the most frequent metaphors used to describe literary festivals are related to food. They are feasts. Their audiences have appetites and literary diets consuming books and culture. In light of this, I suggest that rather than simply engaging in a search for textual interpretation or author worship, what Ishiguro's audience in the Sheldonian craves is the return of some kind of physicality to the author's text and generally to the act of reading itself. For this, they agree to travel to Oxford. They stand in line for admission to this building, which is itself the physical embodiment of past and present culture. They sit in precariously positioned, uncomfortable seats, jammed uncomfortably close to people they do not know, so that they can hear words spoken out of the body of the man whose mind worked through his body to produce the words they have experienced in their own silent world of private reading. They want to reunite their intellectual experience of the text with the visceral physical world. Karen Litow of the University of Essex Department of Literature, Film, and Theater Studies writes of this physicality of reading in her 2006 work, 
theories of reading, books, bodies, and bibliomania, in which she seizes on the reader as a sensuous figure, not solely as a sense maker. Working off of Litau's ideas, I would suggest that the reader listening to Ishiguro's public conversation in the Sheldonian seeks, however unconsciously, to move away from the predominantly modern notion of reading as a purely mental activity focused on, ter on interpretation of meaning toward a more affective response that acknowledges emotion and physical sensation, one that Litau locates in a past dominated by reading aloud. This, I would say, is in fact the reader's overarching, if unacknowledged, motivation for attending the Literary first Festival in the first place. Acknowledging the possibility of this helps us see the world of the festival and its consumption by readers more clearly. So where does the electronic book fit into this? How does the disembodied book find a home in the sensuous world of the festival? How does it fulfill the needs of the reader who yearns for a physical experience? Several things occur to me here. First, what is lost in terms of the print book's tactility, the ebook and e-reader easily, perhaps partially, compensate for by providing greater connection with the community of readers through sharing of comments, tags, and textual highlighting. Secondly, I'm not convinced that reading a book on a Kindle is any less physical than reading a paperback, which has become pri a primarily mental activity in our silent reading culture. Which brings us back to the public nature of the literary festival. Solitary reading on whatever platform remains essentially a non-physical activity and requires stimulus or performance of some kind to transform it into a sensual embodied experience. Of course, as the sales of digital editions of books outstrip printed volumes, what will replace the festival's piles of books? Already we see a very visible electronic presence at festivals, not only in programs that address the topic, but in sales tables devoted to e-reading devices, such as the John Lewis Kindle table at the Oxford Festival, and in activities and areas where the festival goers can get hands-on experience with new formats and devices, such as the digital bookmobile at the National Festival of the Book. Perhaps the piles of books will co coexist with these new features for some time, as publishers turn to limited special editions. Certainly, there are many books that do not lend themselves yet to electronic format. More puzzling is how the author's signature will be negotiated when there is no print copy to sign and the reader presents an e-copy on a device. Electronic signatures on tablets such as the iPad or Kindle Fire seem a likely development. In fact, a company called Autography has already produced a method for inserting a signature into an ebook along with a photo or other graphic. Will this satisfy readers? Of course, among the eccentric, there may still develop more interesting solutions that involve other types of signature receptacles. Perhaps we'll see a return to the autograph book, popular with high school students decades ago or a return to the ladies' autograph fan of even longer ago, with authors and artists each signing a rib. This might be an option particularly appealing to the summer festival or, or uh, summer festival participant. Even with changes in book selling and signature gathering, it is unlikely that the literary festival will be harmed by the spread of the ebook. The rich format of the, of the festival accommodates the needs and ambitions of many, providing a stage on which the desires of readers, authors, publishers, librarians, sellers, and fetishists alike can be enacted. In addition to its commercial aspects, it is a unique public performance of the solitary activities of reading, writing, and research, while the continued existence of libraries and booksellers, also sites of literary performance, is threatened by the upswing in digital editions and e-readers, the Literary Festival will remain resilient because it provides access to the author and to other physical aspects of literary culture, moving the solitary reader into a world of physical delight that shows no sign of losing its appeal. Future festivals may bring with them wondrous developments based on new book formats, social networking software, and increased broadcast capabilities, including new opportunities for interactions between authors and readers. Insofar as they remain physical events, however, they will undoubtedly always feature events at which animating speeches occur.